Welcome to Rice TVX. On today's Rice Report, we're going to look into the history of money and banking in the United States of America. Appreciate you tuning in. We're going to get the show started for you in just moments. <laughs> Now, if you're going to be watching this on replay, I would say fast forward to about the three, three and a half minute mark. Going to be playing a couple quick messages from the sponsors of Rice TVX and then a quick channel advertisement. Uh, information is going to be down below in the video description for the sponsors of Rice TVX, Presearch, Monarch, and BitSwap Dex. BitSwap is the hottest new way to trade tokens. Crawling all the top decentralized exchanges, BitSwap will get you the very best price and value for your trades. BitSwap is changing the game. Try it now at BitSwapDex.com. And we are live streaming on both the main channel, Rice TVX, and we are also live streaming on Rice TVX too. Make sure you are subscribed to both channels. You can find links in the video description for either or channel. Make sure you are subscribed to both. All right, ladies and gentlemen, thank you so much for tuning in for today's episode of the Rice Report. Make sure you smash that like button as, as it helps other people to be able to find these kind of videos in the YouTube algorithm flow. I'm going to be talking a lot more about the Federal Reserve and central banking in future videos, but I wanted to lay some groundwork. We're going to be talking about money versus currency to lay the groundwork for what we're going to be talking about, and that is a brief look into the history of banking and money or money and banking, however you want to say it, in the United States of America. Now, I did a video last night talking about my partnership with Money Metals Exchange. If you haven't seen that video or you have not taken advantage of my partnership, you can get a free half ounce of silver. And at the same time, you get to support the channel. You get to do both at the same damn time. And this is how you can do so, so pay attention. If you are looking to purchase and invest in precious metals, gold and silver are both good safe haven assets to hedge against the financial collapse we are experiencing. Check out Money Metals Exchange. I partnered up with them and you can get a free half ounce of silver. Visit moneymetals.com, be a first time buyer, purchase a minimum of $100 and use the promo code RICE. You get a free half ounce of silver and it's another way to support the channel. All right, so now before we get things started, going to do a quick screen share. I'm going to share a few things about the channel. Then we're going to get into the topic of today's video. Once I'm done talking, if I have any questions or any comments, I will come back to the comment section towards the middle or end of the video. So just stay tuned for that. So what I want to let people know is if you have not already, head over to ricetvx.com. Make sure you sign up for my mailing list. I'm going to start sending out a newsletter weekly this week. So sign up for my mailing list so you can stay updated, never miss an update or new Rice TVX content or happenings. That's going to be the first thing that's going to pop up on ricetvx.com. Once you do that, you click off, click that X off, or if you've already signed up, you will find my various social media sites right here linked at the very top of the website. The two on the far right, uh, the star in the cloud, those are uh, pages with my previous music. I used to sing in bands, and I may be doing some new music here hopefully soon. And if you want to check out some of my older music, you can do so via these two links. Also, there's a contact tab you can hit. There's an about me section. There is a support me section, and the shop is going to be coming soon. I've been getting lots of requests for merchandise. I'm trying to get some help. I'm playing catch up from being sick and all the traveling. Once I'm able to get a little bit of help, hopefully we'll get the shop and merchandise going. So stay tuned for that. Make sure you're subscribed here on Rice TVX and the backup channel side channel Rice TVX2, both on YouTube. Be sure to follow me on Odyssey and Library. I'm posting up extra content and I can also share videos on there as well. I can repost old videos. I've been sharing a lot of recent appearances that I've been making. 
such as Off the Chain on Crypto Blood CBTV's channel. Also, uh, my recent appearances on BitBoy Crypto's Around the Blockchain. I'm going to be appearing on Around the Blockchain tomorrow, Friday, the 4th of February at 5 o'clock p.m. Eastern Time, 2 o'clock p.m. Pacific Time. You can support what I do on Patreon. You can get early access to videos and exclusive content as well over on Patreon. If you'd like to send a tip or contribute to the channel, I have my PayPal, my Cash App, and my cryptocurrency addresses via my Coin Tree link in the video description if you would like to support the channel. If you're interested in getting involved in cryptocurrencies, uh, also in the video description, my link tree for Rice Approved. These are the platforms and services that I recommend for anybody interested in cryptocurrency. You can see all kinds of different platforms, trading platforms, ways to earn cryptocurrency, earn interest, education, and much more. And I mentioned the Money Metals deal, so make sure you take an advantage to get that free half ounce of silver, support the channel. Be a first-time buyer over at moneymetals.com. Purchase a minimum of $100. We're talking like five ounces of silver at the price today, which is right around $22.50. And you'll get a free half ounce of silver and you get to support the channel. Now, the first thing that I wanted to mention before we get into the history of stuff, uh, I also wanted to throw up some banners down at the very bottom of the screen. I do want to let people know to beware of imposter, imposter accounts, fake accounts, whether pretending to be me. Uh, the only place you'll find me on social media, the only username is going to be at Rice TV X. If you get a message from Rice TV X X or whatever, it's not me. It's someone like myself is claiming to be myself sending messages to you, emails or direct messages asking for money, asking for cryptocurrency, asking you to get involved in some investment scheme or pyramid scheme. That is not me. I will not do that. And most of the time, the other content creators that I work with, they're not going to be doing that either. So I encourage you to report those accounts. I'm not going to do it. And I think most people know how I interact and, and the values and morals that I represent. So I hope that you would recognize a, an imposter account and report them. So I just had to do that public service announcement. And I will throw that up throughout the video. Uh, if you're interested in getting some cryptocurrency consulting, you can do so by emailing me at ricemediagroup at protonmail.com. And you can put consultation in the subject line. These are my prices for hour and half hours. And I'm also doing group rates. So you can inquire via email. Or if you know my social media contact, you can hit me up via DM. And obviously, make sure you're signing up for the mailing list over on ricetvx.com. Okay, now the first thing that I wanted to mention and I'm just going to go ahead and go full screen with this so that it's a little bit easier for everybody to see and focus on what's important. All right. So, and again, I will go to the comment section towards the middle or end of the video. So what we have right now is America's national debt is surpassing 30 trillion for the first time. Originally, I wasn't even going to include this, but it makes every bit of sense to include it because this is the highest amount of debt that we've ever achieved in the United States. And we've actually achieved this ahead of schedule based off of estimations on some economists. They were thinking this would be about three years out, and we've already hit over $30 trillion in debt. If you were to go over to the usdebtclock.org, you will see the national debt is over $30 trillion. I mean, this is an insane figure. You can see the debt per citizen, the debt per taxpayer, federal spending, et cetera, et cetera, revenue. There's a lot of information on the U.S. debt clock constantly changing, uh, but I definitely encourage you to check it out. Um, even check it out on a daily basis. And you'll see how these numbers change and fluctuate and just grow over time. Very scary indeed. And a really quick fact based off of that, and I do not have this linked in the video description, but something that I wanted to share was the first and only time our nation has been out of debt was under President Andrew Jackson, who was able to cut debt to zero. The War of 1812 more than doubled the, the nation's debt, and it increased from $45.2 million to $119.2 million by September of 1815. The Treasury Department issued bonds to pay a portion of the debt, but it was not until Andrew Jackson became president and determined to master the debt that this national curse, as, it, as he had deemed it, was addressed. So that's the first and only time in the history of the United States that we've had our debt completely paid off, 
zero debt under Andrew Jackson, who was against central banking. He was definitely a strong proponent against central banking. I think he was pivotal, pivotal in ending the second bank of the United States, if I'm saying that correctly. Um, the time of prosperity was short-lived as state banks began printing and offering easy credit and land value drops. So unfortunately, no matter what uh, Jackson did, the debt seemed to be an issue, but um, he paid out the debt. And I think that's something that people should know and should remember. Now, I wanted to talk a little bit about money versus currency, and this comes from goldsilver.com. This is Mike Maloney's company and website. Mike Maloney does a series that I talk about in various videos called The Hidden Secrets of Money, and I always encourage people to go and check that out. I do have the first video of the series linked in the video description. It's a 10-part series currently that uh, had come out over a couple years. Very interesting information, very educational, especially if this is a subject that interests you and one that you want to learn more about. But just to kind of get into a little bit of simple things in regards to currency versus money. It's shocking that this critical piece of knowledge about investing is not known by most people. What if we told you that those dollar bills in your pocket were not money? Well, they're not. The dollars in your pockets are the national currency of the United States, and there's a big difference between currency and money, and that affects your financial future. There's a really cool little story about how it all began with the Goldsmith story. Uh, I encourage you to check this out. These will be linked down below in the video description. The rest of what I share will be linked down below, and I definitely encourage you to do a deeper dive and look into all this information in, in all its entirety. So you'll see this little graph chart. Well, what's the difference? Money is all of the below plus a store of value. This means money is able to be saved for long periods and retrieved at a later time with its purchasing power unchanged. So money would be things like gold and silver. And our Constitution of the United States recognizes gold and silver as money. Things like dollar bills, debt instruments, these are not money. These are forms of currency. They are a medium of exchange. Um, they're both. In fact, they're both medium of exchanges, units of account, durable, divisible, portable, fungible. But the difference is a store of value. Some people talk about Bitcoin being a store of value. Gold and silver have proven themselves as safe haven assets to maintain the value that you're saving. Because our financial system, our debt-based system, with fractional reserve banking, the Federal Reserve, all the money printing going on, the IMF overheading all of that, the money is being devalued. And this has kind of happened all throughout history. Before we started seeing things like inflation and deflation, there was debasement of currencies. And back in Athens, also in Rome and the Weimar Republic, they were debasing or devaluing their currency. In the case of uh, Athens, the Greeks devalued their currency by adding copper to their gold coins. So it was a 50-50%. So it reduced to 50% of the amount of gold that was actually inside the coinage. Um, this is actually one of the things that led to the fall of Rome and one of the things that Mike Maloney talks about in the series, Hidden Secrets of Money. I think it actually might be in the first part as well. If you're enjoying this video and you enjoy videos like this, smash that like button and also be sure to check out my playlist for Rice Report and Economics and interviews that I've done with Lynette Zhang, George Gammon, videos I've done with Pimpy from Pimpy's Investment Chat and other economists and other content creators who are in the financial space like Rethinking the Dollar and even Crypto Blood. We've had some really good conversations and I encourage people to check those out. So I wanted to kind of give people a little bit of an idea of the difference between money and currency, because there is a difference. Currency is not a store of value. Again, our system, the way that it's set up now is designed that every year you're going to lose purchasing power. So if you save money and, 10 year, and you have a goal of saving your money for 10 years because you want to do something with that money in 10 years from now, you're in fact going to be able to purchase less. 10 years later after saving money, then you would have been able to purchase before you decided to save it. The system is designed for money, for currency to lose value. 
So it's crazy to think about. Also, when you think about the new the national debt, I think I heard a really interesting story that if the United States owned all the Bitcoin and each Bitcoin was worth $1 million, it still wouldn't be enough to pay off our national debt. If that gives anybody any inclination of how severe the situation is, it's insane. So that is the difference between currency and money. Money is a store of value where currency is not. Currency are like the dollar bills in your pocket. There used to be dollar bills like um, silver certificates and gold certificates, which we'll share when I do a little bit of the history of the money. Uh, is this the bills? Um, no, this right here is basic, a basic history of money. Again, all these are linked down below. I'm not going to go over the entirety and every part of it. but uh, And there are some discrepancies when they talk about money and currency. So ignore kind of those things in this, in this particular article. But the key takeaways and some of the other things I'll highlight. Money conveys the importance that people place on it. So we are the ones who give value to anything even gold and silver anything that has value we the people are the ones that set that value we're the ones that give things value if people thought something was worthless we wouldn't be accepting it um in the case of uh venezuelan boulevards uh, people don't want the money uh even in florida when there was a dumpster full of 50 dollar boulevards that were worth less than 20 us dollars even homeless people didn't even want that because they couldn't even exchange the money. Money allows people to trade goods and services indirectly to communicate the price of goods and provides individuals with the way to store their wealth over the long term. Before money, people acquired and exchanged goods through a system of bartering, which involves the direct trade of goods and services. The first region in the world to use an industrial facility to manufacture coins that could be used as currency was in Europe in a region called Lydia. And that's modern-day Western Turkey in approximately 600 BC. The Chinese were the first to devise a system of paper money in approximately 770 BC. So there's a lot more valuable information that you can read. Uh, the transition from bartering to currency, um, China creating the modern-day coin, uh, the first official currency being minted in Lydia, the transition to paper currencies, the emergency of currency wars, mobile payments, virtual currencies, and the bottom line. And the next article that I wanted to share comes from Insider, and it's a history of money. It's a brief look at American currency. I thought this would be kind of interesting to show a few different things about American history, going over some of the various different currencies that we've used. First of which was between 1775 and 1790, and that is the Continental Congress. This is a picture of it, and it was used to finance the Revolutionary War. Um, the Continental Congress issued paper money backed by an the anticipation of tax revenues. It was the first federally issued paper money without solid backing and easily counterfeited. So these were not backed by gold and silver. These were just paper certificates that were backed by the anticipation of tax revenues. We had silver coins from 1792 to 1863 and then gold coins from 1795 to present. With silver and gold, uh, Congress passed the first Coinage Act in 1792, giving the United States meant responsibility for creating coins for public use. Silver coin is usually 90% silver with the remaining 10% of copper for, for strength. The law directed money to be made from copper, silver, and gold. And today, these coins, quarters and dimes, are comprised 70% copper and 25% nickel alloy. So the coinage isn't, isn't even made the way it's supposed to be. And the money's not backed by gold or silver, which technically would be unconstitutional. Um, and I've talked a lot about gold and silver, and I do encourage people to diversify and protect themselves. So take advantage of that partnership with Money Metals, as you heard at the beginning of the video. Watch the video I did last night about Money Metals, about protecting and diversifying yourself. The next um, piece of currency here is the Texas dollar. This was in between 1837 and 1840. The Republic of Texas first issued paper money in 1837. This currency was called star money for the small star on the face of the bill. The star money was not face, was not face value currency, but rather interest bearing notes, similar to treasury bills that were circulated by being endorsed over the next payee. So they weren't exactly 
a, a real form of currency. Uh, they were, like I said, interest bearing notes similar to treasury bills. But states did issue their own money as well or their own currencies, which we'll show. And then we had stank, state bank notes from 1837 to 1863. And these are issued by state chartered private banks. So this would be like BB&T or Bank of America issuing their own currency, which you know could be a possibility in, in the future, depending on uh, what happens with the, the U.S. dollar. So, And we also have the Confederate currency that was used during the Civil War uh, between 1861 and 1864. Then we had fractional currency from 1862 to 1872. It's also referred to as paper coins or shen blasters as the quality of the paper was so poor that with a bit of starch, it could be used to make paper mache like plasters to be used to treat wounded legs. <clears throat> Excuse me. And that was introduced following the outbreak of the Civil War. Fractional notes that were used between 1862 and 1876 and issued in 3, 5, 10, 15, 20, 25, and 50 cent denominations and it was used to provide change at the time when people were hoarding gold and silver people knew the value of gold and silver and hoarded it and there was a reason why they did so um so you know keep that in mind you could definitely learn a lot from history then we have demand notes from 1861 to 1970 1917 to finance the civil war the u.s treasury issued paper money for the first time in the form of non-interest bearing notes popularly called the greenbacks due to the distinctive green ink. The United States government placed demand notes into circulation and used them to pay salaries and expenses incurred during the Civil War. Then we had national bank notes. Um, I'm not sure what the dates are there. It's kind of screwed up, like going through 1935. Backed by United States bonds, these notes were issued by national banks and chartered by the United States government. State banks issued their own notes prior to the Civil War, but in 1863, the National Banking Act established a system of national banks. So this is similar to banks issuing their own form of currency, but this was backed and supported by the United States government. And I mentioned gold, certif gold certificates. I don't know why I can't talk. Gold certificates and silver certificates. Uh, first authorized in the United States government, gold certificates were first printed in 1865, backed by gold coin and bullion deposits. So you can actually take these particular bills and exchange them for the said gold or silver um, at the rate of $20.67 per ounce was established by the Coinage Act in 1834. And that was up until the United States confiscated gold when they forced United States citizens to sell gold in 1933, I believe. Uh, is when that was um actually it says right here yeah the gold reserve act of 1990 of 1933 required the surrender of all gold certificates including physical gold rendering them obsolete however it's legal to collect them today as restrictions were removed in 1964 and silver certificates act the same um you could go to a bank in exchange for silver so uh, i have a few of both of these notes um, i find these to be one of the most sound form of money the United States had, um, even though the money was supposed to be backed by gold and silver, these were actual silver and gold certificates. And then last but not least, uh, the Federal Reserve banknotes, uh, which were from 1913 to 1935, and then the Federal Reserve notes from 1913 to present. And Richard Nixon took us off the gold standard in 1971, officially making the dollar backed by nothing, zero. They say it's backed by the faith of the American government, but um, it's also backed by the, the might of the military as well, is another way I would put it. Okay, so the next two articles have a little bit of a confliction. Um, and uh, the confliction has to do with the number of central banks in the United States that took place. This particular website, stopprintingmoney.com, and the Learn History of Money and Banking, has where the cent where the Federal Reserve would be the fourth, the fourth attempt at central banking in the United States. And I'll share that in a minute. The other article has it as the third, and there is some argument to that. And I'll explain what the argument's about. This article is a great article. I definitely encourage you to check it out and look at it in its entirety. 
It talks about fractional reserve banking, central banking, monetizing debt, and so forth, the history of money and banking. So the first real bank that we're aware of in history, as we know it, is the Bank of Venice, the Venetians. And this would have come from a word that rhymes with Venetians, the Phoenicians. So they were so, uh, the Phoenicians are from the Babylon Samaria era and time and area area and era and are thought to be the ones who created a lot of the alphabet, the monetary systems that we utilize and a lot of other things that we utilize. So the banks of Venice were an extension of Phoenicia. And um, so I find that to be interesting and I'll talk about the occult commerce. Then we also had the Bank of Amsterdam, the Bank of Hamburg, and then the Bank of England. Then the Rothschilds, so Mayor Amschild, Amschild Rothschilds was from 1944 to 1812. He's the one who said, let me issue and control a nation's money, and I care not who writes the law. Uh, it's a very famous quote. And so we go into America and central banking, and I'll do a comparison here in just a moment. But we have the first central bank, the Bank of North America, and that was in 18, 1781 to 1785 that's right at the creation of our nation and uh, i believe it was george washington who um was the president when this was founded and it was modeled after the bank of england um, but did not establish legal tender and that might be some of the argument that some people have so that's the first central bank the second central bank is the bank of the united states in 1791 uh, to 1811 Jefferson argued against the constitutionality of a central bank, but George Washington eventually sided with Alexander Hamilton and the second central bank of the United States was granted a 20 year charter in 1791. It goes through the history of what happened with that, but ultimately these attempts at central banking ended up a failure and ultimately were replaced with different charters until we got to the federal reserve. And that was a big battle in history that gets covered up and i encourage people to check out the book creature from jekyll island from g edward griffin or the book uh, i think it's called the history of banking and money in the united states by murray rothbard <coughs> excuse me okay so we had the third uh central bank the second bank of the united states from 1816 to 1836 this is the one i believe going back in history that andrew jackson would have gotten rid of um, if I understand my history correctly. Okay, so the third central bank was 1816 to 1836. This is another, this is another 20 year charter. Uh, this bank was a carbon copy of the others. It was required to raise 7 million in gold and pay Congress a 1.5 million fee for the charter. By the second year, it had only raised 2.5 million, much of it being foreign investment. Loose monetary policy resulted in a boom, bust economic cycle. Uh, it has been speculated that taxpayers lost 40% of their wealth during this period. The case for constitutionality of central banking. So this also goes in the argument of the Federalists and Anti-Federalists because central banking kind of goes hand in hand with central government and central planning, which is also a form of communism when you really get into it. The era of no central banking and the Civil War. So that's the time period of when um, the banks were issuing their own currency. So after Jackson closed the second bank of the U.S. in 1836, so I was correct, and before the Civil War, only states could charter banks. However, ab abuse of fractional reserve banking and poor oversight led to extensive bank closings during this period and significant loss of money by depositors. So the, there's been a really crazy banking history in the United States. And this is one of the reasons why I wanted to cover this, because some people don't realize that we had a first central bank, the Bank of, the, of North America, the second central bank, which is the Bank of the United States, the third central bank, the second bank of the United States, and then the fourth attempt, uh, which, which is stuck longer than any of the others um, since 1913, the fourth central bank, the Federal Reserve. Prior to World War II, East Coast businesses were doing well and were, fun, were funding growth out of profits rather than taking out loans, which is the way you would like to do things, but the banks obviously didn't like that. So banks in the West were flourishing with growth and taking deposits from East Coast banks. 
The government was flush with money and was paying off debts as well. None of this was beneficial to the East Coast bankers who could foresee the need for bailouts looming in the horizon. They knew the best way to accomplish this was through a central bank. That's when you had figures like Nelson Aldrich, Abraham Pyatt Andrew, Frank A. Vanderlip, Henry P. Davison, Charles D. Norton, Benjamin Strong, and Paul M. Warburg, uh, all helping to create uh, what we know now as the Federal Reserve for it to ultimately get passed through Congress after several attempts. I think Nelson Aldrich ended up having to absolve himself. If this is a subject that interests you, I'd also encourage you to check out my interview with Hotep Jesus. He wrote a book recently called The Patriot Report, which goes over a lot of this history of banking in the United States uh, from a completely different perspective. So then we have the Great Depression information, results of the Fed as a central bank, and then the crisis of 2008. So this article, StopPrintingMoney.com, has a wealth of information. Now here's where you'll get a little bit of conflicting information. This comes from the Federal Reserve, and this is the Minneapolis branch. And it's a history of central banking in the United States. So they say a new nation, uh, 70, 1775 to 1790. Talks about the Continentals, uh, but doesn't necessarily mention here the bank that is mentioned first in the United States, which is the Bank of North America. So and that's between 1781 and 1785. Here, that's the time period it would be, but it's not listed. So what they have is the first national, the first bank of the United States. So they're not including the other one, which is again, the Bank of North America, which is the first central bank, the first technical central bank. I don't know if the argument was because they didn't establish legal tender. I'm not sure what that argument is, but some people look at the Federal Reserve as a third attempt and I'm calling it the fourth attempt based off actual history. But the rest of the information pretty much coincides. But I wanted to show you these two parallels because what's written on the Federal Reserve website doesn't include information that should be included. And that would be uh, between 1781 and 1785, the first central bank, the Bank of North America, which is not mentioned um, at all. So um, just showing you where Sometimes people omit things from history, unfortunately. Then we had the second bank of the United States. Then the free banks, which is where the banks were issuing their own money, uh, their own currencies. National banks, um, which had to do with the government uh, being involved with the national banks. Uh, the panic in 1873, 1893, and 1907, which is laying the groundwork for the Federal Reserve Act which took place in 1913 and on going to present. The last thing I was going to show, and this kind of gives a little bit of a good timeline, uh, economics in the United States, 21st century edition, uh, talks about some of the banking issues in 1907. And this is all from 1900 onward and gives a lot of really good information, good timeline. I like timelines, really simple to look at, real easy to grasp what is going on there. Um, real quick, I want to throw this back up again to remind people, beware of an imposter account. I'm not going to DM you or email you regarding anything about sending me money or crypto or participating in any kind of investment or pyramid scheme. Please report these fake accounts. You're going to have this happening not only for myself, but other content creators. So again, beware. Always do your own research. Um, you can go to my website, ricetvx.com, and see if it matches up with my social media. Um, most of the time, again, I'm not going to be doing those things. So if those things are occurring, beware. I'm not going to go over all the information. It's going to highlight some of the more important things. But again, if this interests you, go through all the links in the video description and look at all this in its entirety. So we had the Federal Reserve being created, the Federal Reserve Act in 1913. That's obviously a big deal. And they also uh, passed the 16th Amendment, which some say was never really ratified, um, to the Constitution, empowering Congress to levy a direct federal income tax on U.S. citizens and the creation of the IRS. So you had the Federal Reserve, taxation of labor, and the creation of IRS all in the same year. 1929. 
Uh, on October 24th, Wall Street crash, known as Black Thursday, becomes the most devastating stock market crash in the United States history. They say what we have going on now is very comparative to what happened in the Great Depression, but I think, and a lot of other people think it's going to be much worse. So I think we're going to see a day that is more devastating to the stock market crash than Black Thursday. So we have the Great Depression continuing on, 1933. This is where the Emergency Banking Act takes place. Um, the selling of gold back to the, gov or to the government, uh, the creation of the FDIC, also the creation of securities and the Securities Exchange Commission, the creation of social security numbers because birth certificates were already created at that point. So a lot of things happened in 1933. Then we have 1935, the Social Security Bill that got passed. Uh, as we continue on, um, 1941, we have everything going on at World War II. Then in 1944, another pivotal thing. Fearful on another Great Depression, world economic leaders meet in Bretton Woods, New Hampshire, to establish a new world economic order and discuss global monetary policy. They believe that establishing a global economic order would inspire peace among nations following World War II. <laughs> um, that didn't really work out as planned, but what we call Bretton Woods established the United States dollar as the world reserve currency, um, which gave the United States an incredible amount of power. 1951, the Korean conflict. 1956, Congress passes the Unemployment Assistance Act and more. 1964, we have Congress passes President John F. Kennedy's $12 billion tax cut and the economic economy takes off. A winning argument for fiscal policy. Um, he also created uh, the silver dollar. And um, that was not... The, the, the banks didn't like what, what he was doing. Uh, there's a lot of people didn't really like what JFK was doing. And you know, ultimately, he faced his demise because of it. Unfortunately, uh, then President Lyndon B. Johnson took over, um, signs a landmark amendment to the Social Security Act, creating Medicare and Medicaid, and undid a lot of things that JFK did. 1971, this is in response to public fur, fur over rising food prices. The Nixon administration imposes wage and price controls to curb inflation. Although inflation is initially halted, it shoots up when controls are removed. And the same time period is when Richard Nixon took us off the gold standard and the United States dollar was no longer backed by gold or silver. And all the money that was being printed was unconstitutional. It's a lot more information goes into stock market issues, uh, the, the NAFTA agreement, uh, things that Bill Clinton did, the Glass-Steagall Act, the dot-com bubble, 2008, 2009, some issues in 2010. And this particular timeline goes up to 2011. So that's kind of a little bit of a timeline from 1900 on currently. And that kind of gives you a little bit of a look at some of the bills, uh, some of the currency that was used throughout history and the four attempts at central bank in the United States with the fourth being the federal reserve. So it's really interesting. I definitely encourage people to make sure that you're studying your history because these things are very important. Um, and I'm going to be doing a lot more videos about the Federal Reserve and central banking, the IMF, the World Economic Forum, so people can grasp and have a little bit of better information. All right, we're going to get ready to wrap things up. But before I do, make sure you smash that like button. If you're not subscribed already, make sure you subscribe. We are live streaming on Rice TVX and Rice TVX2 as two channels. On YouTube, make sure you subscribe to both. Links are in the video description. And um, let me go ahead and see what people are saying in the chat. Again, I appreciate everybody for tuning in. Uh, I greatly appreciate everybody for being here with us tonight. I'm going to be going live um, tomorrow again, 5 o'clock p.m. Eastern time on BitBoy Crypto for a round of blockchain. 
And then 7 o'clock p.m., going to be live on Rice TVX and Rice TVX2 for the newest episode of Crypto Rewind, covering the last week in crypto with my co-host, Satoshi Sean. And our guest is going to be Litecoin Lisa Davis. So she will be joining us tomorrow at 7 o'clock p.m. here on this channel. Michael, appreciate you tuning in. Thank you so much. Johnny uh, Midas, thanks for uh, tuning in from Palm Desert, California. Miss Space Cake, how are you doing? Um, we're going to get you some shirts, I promise. Let's see here. Proper Persona, thanks for tuning in. Sherry Ives, uh, fungible and yummy. <laughs> Andy Lee, thanks for tuning in. TPA, what's going on, my friend? Thanks for uh, watching tonight, man. I appreciate it, and I'm glad you made it. Proper persona has it right. A banknote equals an instrument of debt. Uh, on a funny note, some collector sets of Monopoly are worth a lot of U.S. dollars, which is really funny that fake money is valued by other fake money. Uh, I haven't seen these priced in gold or silver, but I find it really interesting that some of these old Monopoly sets actually go for a hefty amount of U.S. dollars. And I've seen a meme that had a U.S. dollar and a Monopoly bill side by side. And it said, the only difference in these two pieces of paper is you believe that one of them has value. And it's so true. I mean, now that we've gotten off the gold standard, our money's backed by nothing. Uh, let's see here. I got some spammy stuff going on. I want to block this user. Doing a little cleanup. Um, maybe somebody else did this for me. Hopefully they did. Renee, good to see you in the house. Thanks for joining. Gulag, thank you so much. Under the cover of CVD, they were able to print 65% more money to keep this thing afloat. Yeah, I've been hearing um, about 50% of the money supply or more has been printed up in the past two years. Um, definitely since March of 2020. And it's gotten really crazy. Yes, Andrew fucking Jackson. He did a great thing. Um, he was not a former executive of BlackRock. Um, Robert Hammock, uh, <laughs> always trying to perform some kinds of magics. Some kinds of magics. Juan, appreciate you tuning in, my friend. Um, you're welcome, and thank you, man. I appreciate you tuning in. Brian, thanks for joining. Uh, I encourage people... Go over to Brian Parker's channel. This is his channel. He recently had me on a show. If you haven't seen that episode, go check that out. I also have a, the link for it available for public uh, and free on my Patreon channel. So you can check that out. And also make sure you subscribe to his channel. And he's been on Rice TVX two or three times. So he'll be back on soon. Apologize about my voice. Still getting over the sickness. And uh, getting a little bit of a dry throat. Yeah, we got Moon. This Moon individual is a uh, bot. So I have to get rid of the bot. Um, if I have any admins in the house, that would be great. Johnny Midas, thanks for tuning in. Venom Splat, you uh, are correct. Gold backs do rock. And if people don't know what we're talking about, these gold backs, the world's first spendable, interchangeable, small denomination physical gold. These, um, these particular, they look like notes or bills, uh, but they actually have gold inside of each one. Each denomination is bigger and has more gold in it. And the smallest denomination is one one thousandth of an ounce of gold. Um, you can purchase a minimum of $100 worth of these things. If you're a first time buyer here at moneymetals.com. Use the promo code RICE, R-I-C-E. You get a free half ounce of silver and you support the channel. Just saying. So make sure you're taking advantage. Appreciate. Um, Gustav, not really covering cryptocurrency on this particular episode. I will be doing uh, Crypto Rewind. So if you want to tune in tomorrow uh, or email me if you have any requests. If you join my Patreon, I take uh, channel requests, video requests on my Patreon channel as well. I'd be greatly appreciated. Uh, yeah, I have the Utah and I have Utah and Nevada. Um, I don't have any of the New Hampshire ones. There's also an Irish one out. I think it's just one bill. How long do you think this house of cards can keep going? Well, um, Dan Best, that really honestly depends on how soon they can try to implement a CBDC 
a central bank digital currency, which would be a Fed coin. Um, so it's possible they could keep this going longer. Um, but we're, we are at the end. How, when, when it's going to end and what's going to cause the end, a lot of people cannot say, really no one can say, because we are in uncharted territories. But based off of history and fiat money and the way that it's performed, and you look at other nations and other currencies, we are at the, we are way beyond the end of our cycle. Hector Identity Block, appreciate you tuning in. Um, yeah, no, it is going to be everything's going to be over spot price, and you're going to be paying more for smaller denominations. So take that in mind as well. Uh, Johnny Midas, thanks for showing some love over there, man. What is it with these scammer accounts? I just have to keep blocking accounts here, but we're getting ready to wrap up the stream, but. Uh, I don't know if TPA is still in house. TPA is really good about doing this stuff. So I'm not sure what's happening. All right, ladies and gentlemen, again, I do appreciate you tuning in. Um, trying to get rid of this banner right here and go back to my other screen. Oh, this is something that I wanted to share with people. This is the rise and fall of the U.S. dollar. Um, you can look this up and find this image. Uh, it's really helpful information. This, this is actually a graph chart showing the value of the U.S. dollar since 1913 when the Federal Reserve got was created, as you can see right here. Uh, the Wall Street crash, Black Thursday, Bretton Woods Agreement that I mentioned. They don't mention um, the Nixon shock, but they talk about the oil crisis, the second oil crisis, the dot-com bubble. But this is when the dollar was worth its full value, and this is as it's going down, and we're... We're at like 1919, 1920, and it's lost almost half of its purchasing power, started going up, started going down, going back up. As you can see, it's just been on a complete decline. And this particular uh, graph only goes up to 2019. So we would actually be a lot lower uh, than where we are now. So to give you an idea, a $20 bill used to be interchangeable for an ounce of gold up until... It was $20.67 for an ounce of gold. Um, and that was up until 1933, I believe. And the price stayed around $35 until, I think, 1970s. But the value of a $20 bill and what you could buy was going down considerably. And back then, you used to be able to buy a nice... Nice suit, let's say that for, for gentlemen. Used to be able to buy a nice suit for $20 for a gold for a one ounce of gold. Today, for the price of a nice suit, you can't buy that for $20. You can still buy a nice suit for the price of an ounce of gold, which um the current price of an ounce of gold is eighteen hundred dollars roughly. So I know I could buy a nice suit for $1,800, but I cannot buy a nice suit for $20. And that's where the dollar has lost its purchasing power. And that is ultimately what is inflation has been doing. It is a hidden tax. And it is designed to take away money from you. Which is the reason why I encourage people to diversify and protect themselves with things like precious metals gold silver copper other metals and i'm a strong proponent of cryptocurrencies as well so again on friday the fourth tomorrow i'm going to be going live on bitboy crypto for around the blockchain five o'clock p.m eastern time and then seven o'clock p.m eastern time here on rice tvx and rice tvx2 for crypto rewind with satoshi sean and our guest, Litecoin Lisa. So be sure to tune in. Thank you for watching tonight. Smash the like button. Make sure you subscribed. And I will leave you with this. Be blessed. Be the change. Practice change.